Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening for this special joint event, the second annual joint event between the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Texas at Austin and the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies at the University of Oklahoma. My name is Jonathan Kaplan, and I'm the director of the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies here at UT Austin. On behalf of my colleague, Professor Alan Levinson, who directs our sister center at the University of Oklahoma, I would like to welcome you to this evening's lecture. Both of our centers owe their origins to the visionary philanthropic support of Charles and Lynn Schusterman and the Schusterman family philanthropies. Our centers have for many years exchanged faculty for lectures and gathered faculty for dinners and lunches at conferences. With the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic and the turn to Zoom as a resource for events, we've been afforded new opportunities to collaborate on events and hence tonight's lecture by Dr. Samira Mehta of the University of Colorado at Boulder. I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this event, the Department of History and the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at OU, and the Department of Religious Studies, the Department of American Studies, and the Center for Women's and Gender Studies at UT Austin. I would also like to thank the UT Schusterman Center's Administrative Associate Karen Marco and the OU Schusterman Center's Administrative Assistant Trice Hyman for their work on tonight's event. Before I welcome Professor Levinson to introduce our speaker for this evening, a few practical comments. Since this is a webinar, you will have to pose your questions, and we very much hope that you will engage in discussion in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Please feel free to add your questions as you have them. We will only be responding to questions put in the Q&A box, not in the chat. I will pose those questions to Dr. Mehta after her presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Alan Levinson, who is the Schusterman Josie Chair in Jewish History and Director of the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies at OU, and a scholar of modern Jewish history and thought. Professor Levinson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all for being here. Thank you, Jonathan, so much for your kind and, uh, and, and really uh, moving remarks about the collaboration we've had as uh, nearby, but not not exactly in the same city centers. And it's uh, uh, also our great pleasure to uh, look forward to collaborating with uh, the Schusterman Center at UT Weston, Texas, for many years to come. I apologize for my uh, 3.0 glasses. They're a little bit glary, but I'll be quick and uh, introduce today's or tonight's speaker, uh, Samira Mehta, is Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies and Director of Jewish Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her research and teaching focus on the intersections of religion, culture, and gender, including the politics of family life and reproduction in the United States. Her first book, Beyond Chrismica, The Jew Christian Jewish Interfaith Family in America, uh, was a National Jewish Book Award finalist. Absolutely wonderful book that I can recommend to all. She's also the author of a newly released book of personal essays called The Racism of People Who Love You. Professor Metz's current book project, God Bless the Pill, Sexuality and Contraception in Tri-Faith America, examines the role of Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant voices in their competing moral logics of contraception, population control, and eugenics from the mid 20th century to the present. Professor Mehta is also beginning a project for Princeton University Press called The Mixed Multitude, Jews of Color in the United States. And Professor Mehta is also the primary investigator, PI, for a Henry Luce Foundation funded project called Jews of Color, Histories and Future. She's the co-editor of Feminist Studies and Religion blog, co-chairs the steering committee of the North American Religions Program Unit at the American Academy of Religion, and is creative editor at the journal American Religion. She holds degrees from Swarthmore College, 
Harvard University and Emory University. And we're thrilled that she could join us tonight. And I'm very, very honored to welcome Professor Samira Mehta. Hello, I'm so glad to be here. I am um, going to start sharing my screen right from the get-go. So I want to start by saying thank you very much to the Schusterman Centers of the University of Texas at Austin and the University of Oklahoma, and to all of the folks in both locations for the work that they did to bring me here in my virtual form to speak with you today. Thank you also to everyone who opened your computers tonight to invite me into your homes. I want to begin by explaining to you that I am coming to you from my home, which is a studio apartment. As a result, we may be joined by my cat, Quincy, or you may hear my dog, Daisy. And, oh, wait, let's see, let's try that again. There we go. Here they are, and I will tell you, I wrote this ahead of time and warned you about my great crack, gate crashers. Quincy is in quite a mood this evening, and I'm almost positive that you will be seeing him. Daisy has been bribed for the evening, but the bribes rarely last the length of a lecture. I apologize for the distraction. By contrast, if the distraction sounds good and then they sleep through my talk, which is, I have to tell you, not looking likely, but then I apologize that I promised you entertaining animal content and you didn't get it. I learned early on in my Zoom life that I simply cannot control them. I am not, however, here to talk to you about my pets. I'm here to talk to you about a couple of moments in the history of Jewish engagement with debates about contraception in the United States. Oops, and I just went too fast. There we go. Um, in part, of course, I'm here to tell you about that history because of the current moment when Roe versus Wade has been reversed and when we can see the rollback of abortion rights are likely to lead also to the rollback of rights around contraception. Jewish groups have joined the battle over abortion and contraception, mostly on the side of access to those, um, those pieces of health care that the Jewish groups and others are determining to be rights. And they are arguing that Jewish law and Jewish teaching support a right to abortion. And also, although less prominently at this more moment, the right to contraception. Reproductive rights in this formulation become a religious right. The history presented here today is not meant to undercut those efforts, but rather to demonstrate that history is often messier than the political movements account for. Well, as a historian, I hesitate to play the game of, if, if this historical event had gone differently, our future would be different, or to assume that the lessons of the past are directly applicable to the present, I do think that it is helpful to th take things that seem natural in our current moment. Jews are a mainstay of feminist organizing, or the continuity crisis is a real and worrisome part of Jewish life, or Jews always and uniformly believe in the right to contraception, to, um, to look at them and notice that in different historical moments, we've thought different things. They're not natural or just how things are. I do not think that we can draw a one-to-one -one correlation between the past and the present. I do, however, think that the complexities of the past can be helpful for understanding the present and understanding how both past and present are culturally constructed. So we're going to start with the first part of the story. Jewish leaders, and by leaders, I mean rabbis and cantors, but I also mean leaders in the medical community who happened to be Jewish or Jewish women who were organizers in a variety of social movements. These Jewish leaders were involved in and generally supportive of birth control from their entry into the birth control debates in the early 20th century. We know this from the work of historian Melissa Clapper, whose fantastic book, Ballots, Babies, and Banners of Peace, um, can be seen in the slide. Um, Clapper tells us that Jewish support for birth control as a Jewish right was not a given from the start. Rather, you see prominent rabbis arguing two things. One is that sex is a marital good. 
For many Christians, even, even if marital sexuality was seen as positive, there was either a cultural valuing of celibacy or a cultural valuing of restraint that suggested that if you were kind of done having kids, marital sex wasn't good apart from its procreative potential. Second, you see interesting claims about birth control as a social moral good. So again, nobody's saying in this moment, like the Talmud says that contraception is completely okay, and therefore it's a religious right for Jews to have the right to contraception. Um, rather, people are saying like medicine has given us this thing that has immense social power and is an immense social good. Now, you can also see lots of evidence that Jewish women were using birth control, um, evidence mostly in the declining birth rate, right? So we know kind of what sorts of contraception were invented when, and you can see that over a hundred years sort of ending at the first half of the 20th century, you can see this just sort of downward trend in, in birth rates for everybody, including, or for everybody who had kind of the means and the resources, including Jewish women. Um, and it's important to note that really the reason we're looking at the birth rate rather than sort of evidence for people using contraception is that some forms of contraception, like the diaphragm or the pill will be invented later, we're not to a place with these things yet, will generate medical records, but like condoms don't, right? You just don't sort of have a record for such things. Um, so you're looking at the birth rate for evidence of contraception. These arguments from the early 20th century, um, more or less in this case around World War I, do not talk about Jewish law as supporting birth control. But over the next decade or two, people do start using Jewish texts to make those arguments. So we go from not talking about Jewish law and birth control to sort of building up to seeing evidence in Jewish law for supporting birth control, sometimes directly and sometimes in sort of a roundabout way, right? Jews think marital sex is good. Jews think maintaining maternal health is good. Um, ergo, um, if the way to maintain maternal health is to not have more pregnancies, birth control is good. Um, but by the time my own research picks up the story in 1940, Jews involved in the birth control movement are really starting to frame the issue in terms of religious freedom. In the early 1940s, Planned Parenthood forms a National Clergy Men's Committee. And just to underscore, it was a National Clergy Men's Committee. Um, and this committee is mostly made up of mainline Protestants and also of Jews. Well, Protestants would spend the next two decades developing what they would come to call a theology of responsible parenthood which boiled down to using birth control to slow population growth, to protect maternal health, and to make sure families had no more children than they could provide for, among other things, Jewish leaders increasingly argued that contraception was a religious freedom. They argued that Jewish law had long supported and approved of contraception and had done so on Jewish law, and that on the basis of Jewish, uh, based on Jewish law, and that therefore to let one religious group, this is by the way, kind of an anti-Catholic sentiment, to let one religious group kind of dictate the national attitudes towards the morality of birth control was giving one religion power over the others and that um, Jews had the right, the religious right as a minority tradition to practice birth control as was dictated or at least allowed by their religion. So this is really an argument that's doing pretty well in like the 1940s and the 1950s. This is Pre Alan Guttmacher, president of Planned Parenthood. And he is somebody who really articulates this kind of point of view. Again, he does this in 1967. I'm using his and him as an example because he's really building on 20 years of conversation. You just don't want me to go through the 20 years of conversation right now because I'm actually really here to talk about the backlash against, against the support for birth control. So in 1967, 
in, um, in an issue of the magazine or journal Judaism, in an article called Traditional Judaism and Birth Control, Dr. Alan Guttmacher argues that even the most orthodox of Jews find birth control acceptable in certain situations. Guttmacher used the Talmud, or the body of Jewish law, to explain that celibacy was considered unacceptable in Jewish marriage, but that Jewish law recognized that at times that meant that contraception was necessary to protect the health of a wife or mother or her child. He argued that according to the Talmud, contraception was access, um, acceptable when childbirth could damage a woman's health, potentially to the point of death, but also just damage her health or when she was nursing and therefore pregnancy could um, restrict her milk supply and then damage the life of a child young enough to be exclusively dependent on mother's milk. And he then in this article, which is not a very long article, demonstrated how this body of really quite old law was interpreted in, interpreted in contemporary times. He explained that while he was practicing medicine in Baltimore in the 1930s and 40s, one of his patients was a Rebetzin, the wife of a prominent Orthodox rabbi in the community. The couple had five children, and also what Guttmacher describes as the most advanced and serious case of varicose veins he's ever seen. Um, and he was concerned that because of this medical condition, additional pregnancy would risk her life. They were able to gain permission, the couple, petitioned other Orthodox rabbis, um, a bet din, a tribunal of Orthodox rabbis, for her to use contraception. Guttmacher published this to demonstrate that even the most traditional forms of Judaism were glad to make use of technology, such as birth control, to aid maternal health. Now, the reason he's focusing on, on Orthodox Jews, on halakhically observant Jews, is because it's really clear that the battle here is to establish that Jewish law um, that this is not sort of just a matter of, say, reformed Jews who at this moment are sort of in a very kind of distanced from both the law and Jewish practice moment. This isn't simply a liberal religion sort of frontier. He really is trying to say, like, even the most orthodox. Now, I'm not necessarily making a claim for the, the relative orthodoxy of this couple. I'm kind of trying to explain to you what Alan Guttmacher is arguing here. Um, the year after Guttmacher published his short article, Rabbi David Feldman published the not short, Birth Control in Jewish Law, Marital Relations, Contraception, and Abortion, as set forth in the classic texts of Jewish law. And if I weren't teeny tiny, I would like wave my copy around for you to look at because it's right, it's one of the books on this bookshelf. Um, in the book, Feldman works his way painstakingly through all of the nuances of Jewish law, about which I'm happy as I am able to answer questions in the Q&A. But I want right now to say he does this with an eye towards three goals. First, he wants to demonstrate that Judaism sees marital sex as good, and that both and that therefore both some forms of birth control and abortion under certain circumstances are acceptable in Jewish law. So he's saying Judaism thinks marital sex is good. Judaism thinks it's important to preserve life and the life of the mother um, at sort of all costs. Um, and that means that there are times when certain forms of birth control are appropriate. And there are times when abortion is not only allowed by Jewish law, but actually mandated by Jewish law. And we can, we can talk about that again in the Q&A. Um, he then has two other points. And Irving Greenberg, who's a giant in modern orthodoxy during the second half of the 20th century, notes these two points in a review. So these are things that people were seeing at the time. Like it's very obvious in the text, but this isn't just me, a historian looking back on something that happened 55 years ago. This is something people were talking about at the time. First, um, Jewish teaching, Jewish law is relevant to modern life. That's part of the argument that David Feldman is trying to make here. 
Jewish law is relevant. And second, he's trying to argue also that Jewish law and Jewish teaching might be more in line with the zeitgeist of the late 60s than was Christianity. Basically, this is a moment for arguing that even Judaism, when it looks least modern, the same laws that say you can't have a bacon cheeseburger at the like Woolworth's counter on a Saturday afternoon are, are at the same time more modern than Christianity because they're more accepting about birth control. They're more sex positive. This is part of what Feldman is trying to argue. Now, I want to underscore something here. I'm not trying to tell you that anyone in particular is correct in how they're interpreting Jewish law. Um, I'm not saying that Guttmacher and Feldman were or were not correct, as opposed to either those rabbis in the 1920s who were more hesitant about using Jewish law to support contraception, nor am I saying that they're more right or wrong in their interpretation than contemporary framings. I just want you to note that from the late 1960s to the present, this has been more or less the Jewish stance on abortion and birth control, that some kinds of birth control are sanctioned by Jewish law. So with birth control, the issue is more like, what kind is it? Um, is it a condom? Is it a diaphragm? Is it the pill? Like all of these are thought of a little bit differently. And at some times, so is abortion. That said, while contemporary Jewish movements like to portray those approaches as rooted in ancient Jewish teachings and therefore how it has always been, that is not always what Jewish leaders have said. It is not what they were saying in the 1920s. There are lots of potential reasons for that. One reason could be that the 1920s rabbis um, and the 1960s rabbis and doctors and contemporary Jewish teachers and leaders now were reading the same texts differently. That's one possibility. Another reason could be that until modern medicine created public debates about birth control, rabbis hadn't been part of those conversations. And so people weren't really thinking about those relevant Talmudic passages and it took a generation to get up to speed. So in that formulation, the 1960s rabbis were right and the 1920s rabbis it's not so much that they were wrong as they didn't know what tools they had at their disposal. That's, by the way, what people are saying in the 1960s. Honestly, I don't actually know which is the case. It could be one of those things. It could be something else. I'm not actually a scholar of Jewish law, so I can't evaluate. But what I want you to understand is that over the course of the last 20 years, what rabbis and other Jewish leaders have said about birth control has not been stable. It took a while to get to where we are now. But from the mid 20th century, most Jewish leaders agree that some birth control and abortion sometimes are okay. So it's also true, but not sort of part of the same argument. It's also true that American Jewish women have been historically well represented in the feminist movement. Sometimes they've been, you know, there are feminist movements in Judaism. Sometimes these are women in mainstream feminist movements who also happen to be Jewish. So on the screen here, you have in the red with the pearls, Betty Friedan, author of The Feminine Mystique, Letty Cotton Pogrebin, co-founder of Ms. Magazine and the Ms. Foundation, Bella Asbug of the US House of Representatives, and then Gloria Steinem, who depending on who's counting and who's claiming can be understood as Jewish. Um, she sometimes claims that identity, but, uh, but not has not always, um, who is, both an, an important American journalist and um, with Letty Cotton Pogrebin, a founder of Ms. Of Ms. Um, so these two pieces of history, the Jewish support for birth control and abortion and a strong history of Jews in the feminist movement have sort of caused people to assume that the reproduct reproductive health was supported in Jewish circles for feminist reasons. 
and that Jews have always embraced that technology because of the sort of feminist potential of Judaism. And what I'm currently writing about is that, in fact, the story is more complicated than that. Um, this is also where my PowerPoint gets a little bit less colorful, and I apologize for that. Uh, as you can see, I'm just putting primary sources up. Um, well, Jewish clergy rabbis and lay leaders have been strongly had been strongly supportive of contraception. Once contraception became readily available, American Jewish leaders faced a new problem. The feminist potential of the pill was sort of disrupting Jewish life um, in a variety of ways that we're about to talk about. And as a result, in the late 1970s, there was a flurry of conversation about both the impact of the women's movement in general and contraception in particular on the question of Jewish survival. So in October of 1976, the Institute for Jewish Policy and Planning and Research of the Synagogue Council of America, a council with representation from the Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox movements, held a symposium focusing on zero population growth and the Jewish community. They then published the conference proceedings in their next publication. So zero population growth, or ZPG, was a response to the population bomb a book talking about the idea that the world's population would rapidly outstrip its resources. The movement encouraged zero population growth, which is to say that the number of people born each year should be more or less equivalent to the number of people that died. This movement took many forms, ranging from the idea that couples should have two children, doing more than reproducing them, no more than reproducing themselves, to the idea that many should not have children at all. Um, the Jewish communal conversation, however, tended to conflate zero population concerns with other concerns about the, the Jewish birth rate. So not just the political decision to limit reproduction, but with any other number of social factors that might cause a decline in family size. So the social scientists at the Synagogue Council of America meeting noticed that Jewish women were following more or less the same trends as other American women, but more dramatically. So they were getting more education, they were having careers, and they were delaying childbearing. If American women in general were likely to go to college, Jewish women were likely to get some form of graduate education. Therefore, they were more likely to join the professions. The getting of the education and the establishing of a career delayed childbearing. In addition, women were less likely to permanently leave those highly trained professional careers in order to stay home, raise children, and volunteer at the synagogue and in other Jewish communal organizations. This is 1976. So at the time, it was not quite clear to the leadership whether women were having fewer babies or having them later. The birth rate was down, but would it pick up? According to the researchers, young Jewish women were still saying that they wanted three to four children. Did that mean that instead of having four children in four years, women would have four babies in eight years? Or that instead of having four children between the ages of 20 and 30, they would have four between 28 and 38? Or would starting later, and um, juggling children and career mean that they would have fewer, either because they ran out of time, right? If you say you want four kids and you start at 20, you've got more time before you might start having age-related fertility problems, or because they realized that their des desired family size was going to be unrealistic if they were also going to have a career. As almost any working mother could tell you, kids and career are a lot to juggle and adding a baby does not add a little bit of work, it adds exponential work. These scholars argued that the declining Jewish birth rates and the increased women in the workforce both turned out to be bad for the Jews. Much as the social scientists who I, whom I argued against in my first book saw interfaith marriage as bad for the Jews. Why? Fewer Jewish children meant there was less need for Hebrew school cl for classes, for day schools, for all kinds of infrastructure. 
Similarly, women who worked full-time in professions had less time to stay to than stay-at-home mothers of school-age children for activities that supported the Jewish community, like membership in the Sisterhood or in the National Council of Jewish Women. Rather than understanding the lives of Jewish women were changing and that the infrastructure of the Jewish world might need to change in order to meet the needs of new Jewish women, and perhaps also the needs of the community that those women had been previously charged with meeting in their volunteer roles, these social scientists hoped that the trends would reverse themselves. Because of course, most fundamentally, um, because later marriage and access to contraception led to smaller families and smaller families meant fewer Jews. The um, for these reasons, the demographers at the Institute for Jewish Policy Planning and Research found reasons to hope that some of these trends would simply disappear. For instance, in an article called Fertility Trends and Their Impact on Jewish Education, Harold S. Himmelfarb found cause to hope that as there were soon to be more college graduates than jobs requiring college degrees, it would no longer make financial sense to, for women to go to college. And therefore, quote, women may be less likely to postpone becoming, beginning a family in order to, in favor of getting more education, end quote. The Institute's demographers, once again, all men, place these concerns for continuity, both the literal production of children and the labor that maintained institutions squarely on the shoulders of women. Birth control was not in and of itself a problem, but these articles um, that maintained that the difference between having two children and having three was the difference between Jews continuing and Jews dwindling, um, in these articles, women were encouraged to be pronatal and to see their value as lying primarily in the gifts that their uteruses could give rather than in their intellect. Social changes markedly improved the self-determination of women, their ability to experience professional success, to support themselves and their children, to leave unhappy or abusive marriages, and to control their own bodies were marked not as positive change, but as a problem for the Jewish community. Now, oops, sorry. I have totally lost control of my PowerPoint here. There we go. Um, this was not the only conference on such a topic in the mid seventies, two months after the symposium, the New York Jewish Women's Center sponsored a talk on zero population growth and Jewish survival at Hebrew Union College in New York. So you've got the flyer here and you can see a number of names. Some of them you might recognize. Um, from as significant players in both Jewish communal conversations and in Jewish studies. Um, most notably, Blue Greenberg and Stephen M. Cohen. Cohen and a number of other sociologists, including Sidney Greenberg of Brown University Center for Population Studies and Paul Ritterbrand of City College had the previous uh, February been part of a conference on Jewish fertility, which largely tracked the declining fertility of American Jews, and in some cases, tracked it against other American religions. But you can also see that this was a debate, right? There are presumably, there are people here perhaps not as well known, who are presumably representing the other side. What I'm telling you is not like all Jewish leaders and all Jewish institutions thought women should be baby factories. Like that's not what I'm saying at all, but I am saying like, there's this conversation. What are the ramifications? How is this working, right? Um, in part because of this kind of scholarship, William Berman, a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary, founded a group called PRU, which stood for the Jewish Population Regeneration Union um, and was a pun on the Hebrew phrase for be fruitful and multiply. The or organization incorporated in, in, in 1975 and by 1970 had enough prominence that Shirley Frank would write about them in Lilith magazine. They created pamphlets that encouraged American Jews to eschew Jewish population growth before it was too late. And just as you can see on the slide, 
I liked this image. It doesn't have anything to do with the 1970s. It's a movie from like 2005, but it's a great picture. So, um, the argument that these scholarly voices would make about the change in Jewish family can perhaps be best summed up in comments that Blue Greenberg, not an academic, but certainly a Jewish communal leader, would make to the women's division of the American Jewish Congress on April 25th, 1977. The Jewish community, the, quote, the Jewish community has the lowest birth rate of any religious or ethnic group in the country, yet many Jewish women put off having children until their middle 30s so they can pursue careers, Greenberg stated. For the rest of the world, ZPG is a wonderful thing. For the Jewish people, in view of the huge losses our people have suffered in our own lifetimes, it is a form of suicide, a death wish. Perhaps the Jewish thing to do in light of our community's population needs early with part-time or delayed career for husband and wife or wife. Starting a family 10 years earlier would add a new generation of Jews every 30 years. Greenberg is widely considered the mother of Orthodox feminism. And so there is an irony in, in that her desire to hasten the regeneration of the Jewish community after the Holocaust places a burden on Jewish women. Yes, she suggests that husbands might shoulder some of the burdens of this challenge, but also that basically places, but that also basically places the burden of Jewish continuity on the shoulders of Jewish women. And on some level, places the contemporary population problems on the selfishness of women for their desire to put career ahead of maternity and their failure to sacrifice their professional needs on the altar of community growth. Greenberg was not the only Jewish feminist to strongly support continuity and was Perhaps it was perhaps the seeming urgency of population re regeneration post genocide that caused so many Jewish feminists to support a discourse that strongly burdened women. And as scholars, we have to set these conversations against a broader conversation of what was going on in American life. For instance, well, we've already seen Himmelfarb hoping that the recession would lead more women to decide that the dearth of jobs would cause uh cause women you know to decide not to not to go on and have careers to marry instead of going to grad school the reality is that many middle class american women entered the workforce in the 1970s precisely because of the recession right so he's saying the recession will make education seem like a bad bargain because there won't be jobs anyway you might as well get married the reality is that people needed second incomes yes many women went to work because of the feminist desire to have an intellectually satisfying career but many came to feminism because of the gender discrimination that they experienced in the workplace a workplace that they had entered out of necessity to feed their children we could also consider the social reality that in the 1970s, the first generation of Jews to grow up in the suburbs were becoming adults and marrying. They had grown up with Protestant and Catholic friends, far more assimilated into American life than their parents had been. And while yes, Jewish communal leaders most certainly worried about the force of assimilation, they expected Jewish women, and um, as my other work describes, Christian women married to Jewish men, to have and raise the Jewish women that would replace the people who left Jewish communal life for life as unaffiliated Jews. As attractive as assimilation was for this generation of Jews raised in William Herberg's Tri-Faith America, secularism was also deeply appealing. The baby boom was the generation of what Wade Roof Wade, Clark Roof, and Robert Wuth now have described as religious seekers. So I could talk for hours about this, but the point here is it's not just that Jews are assimilating and becoming less Jewish. Americans are going to church and to synagogue less. So yeah, there's assimilation, but there's also just becoming more secular. Um, that does not mean necessarily that the seekers or those sort of secularizing people who were Jews ceased to identify as Jews 
or to care about having Jewishly rooted lives, but it did mean that they didn't tend to go to large suburban synagogues or necessarily join the JCC. What Jewish life was changing, and there's amazing scholarship on this now, um, although nowhere as much as we need, but you know, there was the sense that because Jewish institutions were dying, that Jewish life was dying. Um, and when we put this in a broad, in sort of the con broader context of American life, we see that this isn't a particularly Jewish problem. It shifts in American society. And the question becomes, how are Jews sort of coping with those shifts? Not, not like, are these things happening specifically to Jews? Like you could also ask, how are Presbyterians coping with these shifts? Um, and when you frame it that way, the question shifts away from Jewish continuity, but that wasn't what was happening at the time, right? Scholars weren't looking sort of outward and comparing the Jewish experience to the Presbyterian experience. And so instead, the argument at these conferences was essentially that feminism, contraception, and the changing status of American women were along with interfaith marriage, a primary threat primarily to Jewish continuity. Um, on some level, one is tempted to say that hindsight is 2020, that it's not fair of me to criticize the scholars of 1976 for their failure to see what I can see from, you know, after 2020, from 2023. I wanted that pun so bad and it doesn't quite work. Um, but there were voices who at the time made some of the connections that I'm pointing out, right? So it's not just that I'm saying, uh, listen, people who were doing work slightly before I was born, how could you not get this? At the time, um, in 1977, a pamphlet call, came out called Call Them Builders. Um, and in this pamphlet, the first woman ordained in the Reconstructionist movement, Rabbi Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, pointed to factors other than maternal failures of Jewish women. She wrote, the continuity of Jews and Judaism is not only numer a numerical issue, but a qualitative one, requiring the strengthening of a Jewish identity. Losses due to intermarriage, secularization, and assimilation cannot be counters countered simply by advocating an increase in the Jewish birth rate. There is no guarantee that more Jewish children will necessarily mean more committed Jewish youth. Well, I might want to argue with Sasso about the implications of interfaith marriage, she did draw back from the birth rate alone, suggesting that there were a wider range of issues that the Jewish community needed to address. Um, in addition, in 1978, two years after the conferences about Jewish fertility and zero population growth, Shirley Frank, managing editor of feminist of the Feminist Press's Women's Studies newsletter published an article in Lilith Magazine called The Population Panic. So she's the managing editor of a feminist newsletter publishing in the Jewish feminist newsletter. Um, population panic was a broader societal, um, was a play on broader societal concerns about the population explosion and the population bomb. Frank, however, was not thinking about overpopulation. She was writing about the Jewish panic about the dropping birth rate. She writes that although the Jewish people have survived for, she said, 3,000 years, we seem to regard our survival as an inexplicable anomaly and our mindset as one of perpetual vigilance against threats to our continued existence. In other parts of the world, she explained, those threats had often been obvious and physical. Right, so she talks about pogroms, she talks about forced conversion, she talks about the Holocaust. In the United States, the threats had been subtler, apathy, assimilation, intermarriage, and ignorance. And indeed, the 1960s rabbis were sort of arguing that the reason the 1920s rabbis did not know that the Talmud was pro-birth control was that they were too ignorant about the Talmud. That was the argument in the 1960s. Um, but she sarcastically says, 
Now, in the 1970s, and I'm quoting again, a new threat has appeared on the horizon, and it is spreading over us like a malignant black fallout cloud. The new danger is an insidious three-initialed foe more to be feared than the KGB, the PLO, or the KKK, namely the ZPG, or the Zero Population Growth Movement. Young Jewish people, it seems, ever concerned about all the problems of humanity, have thoughtfully, although misguided, taking it upon themselves to volunteer en masse to do their share by not adding to the world's population explosion, end quote. She keeps going in a similar tone to talk about how the declining Jewish birth rate, lower than other Americans, far lower than the rest of, is also far lower than the rest of the world's. She points out that Jews have not recovered their post-Holocaust numbers, that Jews are barely replacing themselves, especially accounting for defectors, and that imminent extinction is nigh. Now, I need to remind you, she's being sarcastic here. These all might be things that, that these are all things that are part of the Jewish sociological discourse and debate that are taken as taken as like sort of not natural things, but like taken for granted that these are real. This is what we know. And the Jewish community needs to guard against them. She, however, thought that all of this had a hysterical tinge. And she really called out all of these things as an attack on feminism. She counters by saying Jews have always been a small remnant. They might be a smaller percentage of the global population in 1976 than they had been because other populations are growing faster, but that there were actually more Jews in the 1970s than at many other points in Jewish history. So a smaller percentage of the total population, but a larger number than they had been in the past. She looked at several decades of data showing that the Jewish birth rate had long hovered slightly below that of Protestants and Catholics. And that although the Holocaust had occurred more than 30 years before, it was a relatively new factor in conversations about the Jewish birth rate, right? People were not in the 1950s talking about a crisis of continuity. She also pointed out that it seemed odd at best to assume that couples made their own reproductive decisions with an eye towards what was best for the, a people rather than what was best for themselves and the family they hoped to create. People, in general, she argued, um, do not make their reproductive decisions based on what would be best for the human race, and she didn't think that Jews should be asked to do so, right? So a good example of this is, like, you may think of yourself as a socialist, um, but, like, you don't actually, that's not actually what you do with your own bank account because you're working in a capitalist system, right? That's sort of the argument that she's making. And I use the socialist example because that's the kind of sort of um, community that she would be talking to in, in Lilith. Um, so she's arguing that the women's movement and its ramifications are not part of the zero population growth conversations, but the reason that people are so worried is actually the rise of the women's movement. She um, argues that feminism was, when it's mentioned in the Jewish world, is passed over quickly as essentially a lifestyle trend rather than a movement that was shifting the terrain of American social life. And she called instead for real feminist analysis that would take into account the idea that women, no less than men, should not be asked to sacrifice the, quote, pursuit of personal careers and other indulgences, end quote, over the, quote, traditional joys of family life and the transmission of Jewish heritage to the next generation, end quote. A feminist analysis, she thought, would argue that women's careers are not indulgences. If a man's career is an important component of his full personhood, then so might a woman's be. But more pressingly, women's incomes were no longer, even if they ever had been, there to provide extra luxuries. Women's incomes were quite often necessary to maintain a stable middle-class lifestyle. Um, and Frank doesn't go on to say this, but it's also true in the 1970s that because of rising costs, limiting family size could also be necessary. Um, and she's really, so she's really arguing here, um, that these feminist concerns needed to be part of the Jewish conversation about demography, about a Jewish future. 
Um, but her voice would not go on to affect or shape Jewish demography, Jewish sociology. Um, and, and because that research undergirds most of Jewish communal decision making, many of the resulting initiatives, right? You don't see sort of initiatives that think of these feminist concerns as very real. And that was something that worried Frank in the moment. And as it turns out correctly. So why did I bring all of this up? Um, first, I want to demonstrate that you have to reckon with all aspects of Jewish communal life. You have to take all of the different perspectives into account, even when it pushes against something of a triumphant story of Jewish feminism. You need to say Jewish feminism, which is something that many, many Jewish communities are really proud of, gets certain kinds of time and attention, but not others, right? We need to sort of say Jews were on the forefront of contraceptive sort of um, accessibility, but we're really hesitant about what it meant for Jewish life. Um, and we're also really hesitant, um, not only about endorsing it, but adapting Jewish life to accommodate changes of technology like contraception, but also of social movements like feminism. Um, and you can think about that, again, against the backdrop of broader American society. <laughs> Excuse me. In the contemporary moment, however, I also think that activists using Jewish values and Jewish law to advance reproductive rights today are helped by knowing about movements when Jewish history was not maybe as feminist as we can make it be. Um, it can alert them to ideologies that may still be alive today. It can help them to understand potential gaps between politics and religious teaching. It can potentially help them understand how to bridge those gaps or how to understand that sometimes overt pieces of Jewish communal concern um, actually were running counter to a reproductive rights framework, right? Encouraging Jewish continuity, encouraging certain kinds of increased birthright. Um, they're not necessarily anti-feminist, of course, if that's what people are looking for, but it is a more complicated history. It's more complicated to say birth control was supported in some ways and not in others. And it's that complexity that I'm hoping we can spend some time talking about as we turn to Q&A. Fabulous. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mehta, for a, a wonderful and engaging lecture that really, I think, helps to show the complexity of the history of this issue uh, in, in the 20th century in, in uh, North America. Um, I wanna just uh, invite participants uh, on the webinar, we have a few minutes for questions, to take advantage of the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To click on that, you should be able to submit any questions that you have uh, for Dr. Metza. Uh, and while we're waiting for folks to input their questions, I just uh, wanna begin with one from Dr. Levinson. Do you think uh, Blue Greenberg would, would acknowledge today how much of her analysis places the onus on Jewish women rather than Jewish men? You know, I think that, so I don't know. I know Blue Greenberg, although not well. Um, and so I would, I, would, I would really hesitate to speak for her. I think that it was really very common in those moments to see continuity as a crisis, right? And to see the declining birth rate as contributing to that crisis. Um, I think that in a lot of ways that crisis was sort of as we can see from some of what Shirley Frank says, not, not invented precisely, but more, again, more complicated, right, um, than, than it might otherwise have been, and more tied to ch feminist changes. I think Blue Greenberg, you can hear this optimism that men will step up. Yeah. And um, I think that's an optimism of a kind of second wave feminist mo moment. It's an optimism of a woman who is married to a powerhouse, but a powerhouse who is proud of the fact that she's also a powerhouse. Um, you know, I think somebody with an unusual partnership in her own marriage, unusual for the time. And I think that what we know demographically and from kind of contemporary studies is 
men haven't stepped up. Men have tried in certain, some men have tried in certain ways to step up, but there's been backlash, right? There are sort of movements, think about, this is a Christian example, but think about the promise keepers. But we also know that when couples think they're splitting things 50-50, if you actually like do trackers, they turn out to be splitting things 30-70 men, women. And it's because women tend to do more of the scheduling and intellectual labor or tend to get like the men do the grocery shopping, but the women do the dishes, which are constantly mushroom like, right? Men are given discrete tasks that can be accomplished and women are in charge of keeping the house nice, which is, you know, a little bit like holding back the ocean with a broom. <laughs> it's a Sisyphean task for sure. We've got some questions that are starting to filter in. Uh, the first is from uh, Professor Jennifer Holland. Thank you, Dr. Metta, for gr your great presentation. I'm wondering if there is a separate social cultural history that explains the remarkably high Jewish support for abortion rights. From the 1970s on, it's about 90%, which is just astoundingly high. What mm -hmm. relationship does that support have uh, to the more complicated story you have provided today? And I would like to just maybe tag on to that is mm -hmm. anything uh, within that answer related to a disproportionately high support of, of Jews in North America for the Democratic Party as opposed to the Republican Party as well. So I'm going to try to stay in my lane. So despite your tag on, I'm going to try to answer the abortion piece and it might okay. give some insight. So I think it's really important to note that Jewish law does not support on-demand abortion for any reason, right? Jewish law supports abortion to save the life of the mother. Now, many, many, many Jews, many Jewish ethicists, many Jewish feminists support abortion for much more sort of broadly based reasons. But the reform movement and the conservative movement have at times when stating their strong support for abortion have put qualifiers on it, right? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not um, looking at the fact right now, so I can't remember excuse me, when this happened, but somebody explicitly, like somebody by one of the one of the major movements explicitly says like, abortion isn't okay for economic reasons. Now that's, that's an older statement, but it's, it's a post 1970s statement for sure, right? Um, and Rachel Cranston writes really compellingly about a shift in sort of the conservative movement from talking about abortion as an issue of like sort of women's bodily autonomy to an issue of religious freedom. Judaism says that in order to save the life of a mother, abortion is not just permitted, but mandated. You cannot sacrifice a life to protect a potential life. Potential life is important. Potential life is to be protected, but not at the expense. But And Judaism sees a fetus as potential life basically up until the head is out of the birth canal. Yeah. Sometimes that's framed in terms of a first drawing of a first breath. Um, and so what that means is that some of that support is because, you know, Jews as sort of a religious minority are skeptical about the rights of the, the fact about whether sort of the majority will protect and respect those rights, right? So the argument isn't we should be able to, everybody should be able to have abortion whenever they want, so much as we should be able to make this decision in conversation with our ethical teachings, which we know from lots of experience as a minority in a Christian culture are not always taken seriously by the purportedly secular laws of the Christian culture, right? And I think that, so I don't think, so I think that that's a big part of it, right? That's how it maps onto the more conservative or more complicated history that I'm talking about. You know, it's also true that Jews are statistically relatively highly educated, um, which, which makes them sort of demographically more likely to support things like abortion rights. But I do think that some of that support, some of that support is, is fervently and fiercely feminist. And I think that that's an important thing to say. But the people who might, and it's also important to note that like the majority of Americans support abortion rights, right? But some of that difference, I think, comes of the skepticism of a minority tradition towards having their rights protected and watched out by the majority. 
Yeah, so uh, shifting a little bit from that, and, and I won't uh, push you on my tagged question just a second ago as well, but uh, shifting in a kind of slightly different direction. Obviously, this history is a kind of North American history of the North American Jewish community. Uh, and you, obviously, there's a great population center of Jews in Israel during this time period as well. Have you looked at all, and do you see any parallels or differences between this evolution of discourse and the same type of history you might see uh, um, in, in Israel during this time period as well? So I think it's a great question. It's not a question that I can answer. Um, I'm an Americanist, and when I'm a comparativist, I'm a comparativist, a comparativist within the American context. So I compare the Jewish experience in the United States to Protestant and Catholic experiences every now and then to other minority religious traditions. But I really, I really feel like I couldn't responsibly answer a question about Israel. I'm so sorry. Can you talk about how some of these anxieties about contraception and reproduction intersected with or diverged from anxieties about gay and lesbian movements in the 1960s through the 1980s? You know, that's an excellent question that I can answer, unlike the former excellent question that I couldn't. So I think yes. So I think one of the things that you see in Jewish support for um, gay and lesbian movements is that it really gets much stronger as gay and lesbian movements get closer and closer tied to a marriage equality goal. So I wrote an article with my colleague, Brett Crutch at NYU, thinking about this in terms of interfaith marriage and, um, and sort of Jewish support for what we were calling gay and lesbian rights because of the era that we were writing about, but uh, sort of LGBTQIA rights. And the answer was really like, as what the what the battle as the battleground became the right to have families, the right to adopt children, Jewish movements really got on board. So absolutely, some of the concerns about queerness were concerns about not being in families that were going to do particular kinds of reproductive labor, including actual reproduction. Whereas when what you end up seeing is a conversation, sort of a gay rights conversation about the right to do reproductive later, labor, the right to form families, um, it becomes much more acceptable in sort of, and Jewish communal support, which had always sort of been there, but been complicated, becomes just sort of much, much easier to do, right? It's it's in the end, this sort of conservative impulse to family. Um, and in the article in which we looked at uh, kind of gay rights and, um, and um, interfaith families, the joke that we made when we went and did presentations together is the problem with Brett's marriage is not that his husband is a man, it's that his husband is a Protestant, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, also they don't have kids, but if they had kids and if those kids were raised Jewish, that wouldn't be a problem, right? A household that is going to create more Jewish children, however they do that, right, through surrogacy, through sperm donation, through adoption, is helping with that crisis. Right, right, now that's a good point. Um, one last question, because we're, we're coming to time here, uh, and this is relating to this, the question of the waves of feminism. You spoke mm -hmm. a lot about the second wave feminism, feminism with Bella Abzug and others uh, in the 70s uh, through the early 80s. Do you see a kind of evolution in this discourse as it relates to subsequent waves of feminism, uh, third wave or, or uh, our kind of present day space we're in as well? I think so. I mean, so I talked about the second wave because I'm a historian. Um, and, but I think, so first of all, Jewish feminism does map, right? In this way, it's not like there's a separate Jewish feminist movement. American Jewish women and American Jewish feminists are Americans participating in broader American social movements. Sometimes they're doing it specifically as Jews. Other times they are doing it, you know, um, as sort of people in these movements who happen to be Jewish. There are these moments in feminist movements when Jewish feminists will 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 say that they they are feeling anti-Semitism in the movement, right? Um, 
there was a moment like that in the 1970s um, when the sort of a global women's, the UN year of the women, a statement gets made about Palestinian rights that is a statement condemning Israel and Jewish feminists feel that it's an anti-Semitic statement. Um, you can see similar questions here is, you know, here is a place where I can talk about Israel. You see that coming up again with the women's march, not so much the initial women's march that happened the day after President Trump was inaugurated, but the one that happened, the, the sort of second women's march, in which you get conflict between Jewish groups who had been really involved and Black Lives Matter activists who are um, allied with BDS. Yeah. Um, and so, so the the sort of the places where the Judaism matters is not so much how are they talking about feminism. So you see sort of issues around labor, issues around maternity, issues around sort of life um, in um, in a heterosexual marriage or outside of a heterosexual marriage coming up in different eras and different movements and what the answers are look different, right? You can think of um, sort of the, the tensions that you might see between sort of a stereotypical radical feminist movement of sort of second the second wave and a third wave sort of the like the lipstick feminist movement and the two groups kind of deride each other in a variety of ways right yeah. um jewish women are part of those the ways in which like the people for whom birth control was a fight versus the people for whom birth control was a given the people for whom abortion was a hard one fight and they came of sexual maturity beforehand the people who assumed abortion would always be there um also sort of questions about how you talk about those things, right? How much do you talk about sort of um, when life begins in really black and white terms and when do you sort of talk more in continuum language and how do I think ties into how dire you feel, like how sharp you feel the stakes are. And so different moments in Jewish feminism like in other feminism frame those questions differently depending on the fights that they are fighting in that moment. Right. But again, what's Jewish about them, Jewish women are in those movements. The moments when their Judaism becomes really salient are either when they're bringing those feminist changes into Jewish community with more or less success, mm -hmm. or when because of Judaism, because of their, their identity as Jews, they feel somehow un, un, not understood or attacked mm -hmm. by the mainstream feminist movement. Right. Thank, thank you for that, that uh, expansion and clarification into closer to our time. We really do appreciate uh, your lecture today and your engagement with the audience on, on, on the kind of nuances and dimensions of, of this uh, very interesting and compelling and important talk. And we want to thank you, uh, myself, on behalf of the Schusterman Center here in Austin and, and Professor Levinson in, in, uh, in Oklahoma. We're really grateful for your, your presence here and, and really uh, helping to enrich our understanding of this very, very complex history uh, and, and make it more nuanced and more uh, expansive for us. So thank you, Dr. Mehta, and I invite everyone in the audience to join me to virtually clap their hands with me oh, at this moment. Thank you so much for having me. It was really a pleasure um, to get to know both of you. And I want to thank everyone again for welcoming me into your living rooms or your kitchens or wherever it is that I am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you to everyone. And I wish you all a wonderful and good night.